Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. This time we're tackling a topic that's, uh, well, it's pretty central to Christianity, you know, Holy <laughs> Spirit. So uh, we're going to be going through this Bible study lesson that you sent over. It really digs deep into what the Holy Spirit does and what it means to be like filled with the Spirit and how that all ties into, you know, living a fulfilling and abundant life. It's something I've always found, well, kind of mysterious, honestly, but also like really powerful. Yeah. So, uh, Let's see what we can find out together, right? I think you really hit the nail on the head there. It can seem pretty abstract at first, this whole Holy Spirit thing, but once you start to get it, it can totally change your perspective, like on the whole Christian life. For sure. Now, the lesson starts off by comparing being born into a family, like a regular human family, to this idea of being spiritually reborn through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and that's a great way to put it, I think, because it shows us it's not just about like changing your beliefs or something. It's about getting a whole new identity. Like we're adopted into God's family. And the Holy Spirit is like the proof of that, the evidence that we have this new life because of Christ. It's not just what we think, it's who we are, you know? Exactly. And the lesson even quotes John 3.6, which says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. It's a spiritual change, like a rebirth that goes way beyond just our bodies. This is really the foundation for everything else we're going to be talking about today. And it makes it clear that every single child of God mm. is considered born again through the Holy Spirit. No exceptions. It's not something you earn. It's a gift that's freely given right. to anyone who believes. That's kind of mind-blowing when you really think about it. It really is. And this leads us to another really interesting part, the role of the Holy Spirit as our counselor, our advocate. So it's kind of like having a guide. Mm. A divine guide, I guess you could say, yeah. walking with us on this whole journey of faith. Precisely. The lesson points us to John 14, point one seed 17, where Jesus promises to send another advocate, the spirit of truth, who will be with us forever. It's like a promise that will always have companionship, guidance, and support. That's amazing to think we're never really alone. Mm. that we always have the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us. And this fulfills what Jesus said in John 14 point 18, you know, about not leaving his disciples as orphans after he went back to heaven. It's like he knew that we would need someone yeah. to fill that gap, that sense of loss. And the Holy Spirit does just that. He provides that constant presence and guidance. He's not some distant force. He's involved in our lives, helping us understand God's word, showing us which way to go and comforting us when we're going through hard times. Now, this is where we get to this idea of the Trinity which yeah. is, well, it can be a bit confusing. Right. The lesson mentions it briefly. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's definitely a concept that makes you think, huh, three distinct persons, but one God. And it's not just some theological puzzle. It actually affects how we understand God and how we relate to him. So it's not like adding another character to the story. It's about understanding the fullness of God and how he interacts with us. Exactly. And it makes it clear that the Holy Spirit, along with the Father and the Son, is also God. He's not some lesser being, not just a force or an energy. He's a person with a will, emotions, and he wants to be in relationship with us. That's a huge point because it means our relationship with the Holy Spirit is just as important as our relationship with Jesus. It's all part of the same connection Yeah, with God. And that makes the idea of the Holy Spirit living within us even more powerful. Right. The lesson uses this analogy of glass of water to explain this into all. It's simple. But it gets the point across. Imagine a glass with water in it. The water is inside the glass, just like the Holy Spirit is inside believers. So if you're a Christian, that means the Holy Spirit is actually living inside you. Exactly. John 14.15 tells us he lives with us and will be in us. He's not somewhere out there. He's made his home inside us. And this isn't temporary. It's permanent. Once we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit stays with us forever. This is what makes believers different. Okay, I get that. But then the lesson talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Which seems different than just having him live inside us. Yeah, and this is where things get really exciting. It's not just about having the Holy Spirit there. It's about experiencing his fullness, his power, his presence right. in every part of our lives. So it's not enough to just have him there. We need to actively be seeking his fullness. Exactly. The lesson uses that water glass analogy again, but this time it's a glass that's full to the brim. It's about our lives being so full of his presence that it overflows into everything we do. Like a glass that's so full it spills over. That's a great visual. Yeah. So how do we make sure our glass is full like that? That's a great question. And it's something we'll definitely talk more about. But first, 
We need to understand what this filling really means, how it shows up in our lives. Okay, I'm ready for more. Let's dive into what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of people get this idea that being filled with the Holy Spirit is like, you know, having some crazy out-of-body experience. Yeah. But this lesson really focuses on the actual changes that happen in our lives, the everyday stuff. Yeah, it's not about being like weird or super spiritual. It's about letting the Holy Spirit actually work in us, changes from the inside out. Exactly. And the lesson doesn't just talk about it. It gives us examples. Remember that story about those two groups of people? One group was all about themselves, like how they looked, their problems, what they thought was wrong with them. And the other group, they were just radiating joy and gratitude and love. Yeah. And it wasn't about what they were doing. It was about what was in their hearts, you know? It's like the lesson is saying, look, this is what a life filled with the Holy Spirit looks like. Ah. It's not about trying too hard or pretending. It's about letting the Holy Spirit do his thing and letting him produce his fruit in your life. Okay, so being filled with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. leads to personal transformation. But what's really cool is how the lesson connects this interchange to how we affect other people. It's not just about us, right? Absolutely not. It's about becoming a channel for God's grace, a vessel that overflows with his love and goodness. It makes sense when you think about it. If you're really experiencing that peace, that joy, that love, that comes from the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it naturally spill over yeah. into your relationships and how you interact with people? That's exactly it. You can't keep this kind of joy bottled up. It has to flow out to touch the people around you. There's a great line in John 7.38. It says, streams of living water will flow from within him. Like we become a source of refreshment and life mm -hmm. for everyone around us. And it's not just about doing good deeds. It's about who we are at our core being transformed exactly and this living water it's not something we make ourselves it comes from the holy spirit within us and it satisfies that spiritual thirst that so many people have even if they don't realize it it makes me think about all the people we know who are searching for meaning purpose hope what if we could be the ones to give them a taste of that living water and that's where things get tough because as the lesson says, sometimes our own glasses aren't full enough to overflow. We might have the Holy Spirit living inside us, but we're not experiencing his fullness. So what are some of the things that stop us from being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, the lesson points out three main obstacles. Unconfessed sin, not having enough faith, and disobedience. These are like clogs in the pipe blocking the Holy Spirit from flowing freely in our lives. Okay, let's break those down, starting with unconfessed sin. If we're holding on to guilt, mm -hmm. shame, resentment, it's going to create a wall between us and God, right? Exactly. Sin separates us from God. It blocks the flow of the Holy Spirit. That's why repentance is so important. It's not just about feeling bad. It's about turning away from those sins and accepting God's forgiveness. Like making a U-turn, changing direction and heading back to God. And when we receive his forgiveness, it's like that weight is lifted off our shoulders. We experience freedom and lightness because we're right with God. So holding on to those sins, it's like carrying a heavy backpack, weighing us down and stopping us from experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I like that. It's like trying to fill a glass that already has a rock in it. The water can't fill the glass all the way because the rock is taking up space. In the same way, unconfessed sin takes up space in our hearts blocking the work of the Holy Spirit. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we've talked about unconfessed sin. What about a lack of faith? How does that get in the way of the Holy Spirit? Well, remember how the lesson compared? Receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit to accepting Jesus as our Savior. Both require faith, a belief in God's power, and his willingness to work in our lives. Like going to a well with a bucket, mm -hmm. but not believing there's actually water down there. Yeah. And I got to lower the bucket so you're not yeah. going to get anything. Exactly. Faith is the bucket. That lets us draw from the well of God's spirit. Without faith, we're basically saying we don't believe God can or will fill us. And that limits what he can do in our lives. So we have to believe it to receive it. Mm -hmm. But what about disobedience? Yeah. How does that hinder the Holy Spirit? Think of it like this. Disobedience is like saying no to God. It's choosing our own way instead of his. And when we do that, we're closing ourselves off to the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. Like putting up a wall if, between us and God. Exactly. The Holy Spirit can't force his way in. He wants us to be willing. He wants our hearts to surrender to his will. Obedience is about aligning our will with God's will, making room for him to work in us and through us. So it's not about being perfect. It's about being willing to surrender, to follow him wherever he leads. You got it. And when we do that, 
When we surrender to his leading, the Holy Spirit can flow freely through us, not just impacting our own lives, but the lives of those around us too. This is all making so much sense now. We've been talking about the things that hinder the Holy Spirit, the things that block his flow. But what about the amazing things that happen? When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, what does that actually look like? That's a great transition. I'm excited to talk about that. Remember those fruits of the Spirit we mentioned earlier? That's a great place to start. Yes. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are some incredible qualities. They really are. And they're not just ideas. They actually affect how we live our lives, the lesson says. That these fruits will be obvious in the life of a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit. So instead of being short-tempered and impatient, we'll find ourselves being more patient and kind. Instead of feeling anxious and stressed, we'll experience more peace and joy. Exactly. It's like our default settings are changed. The Holy Spirit starts working in us, producing these fruits naturally. But it's not just about us feeling better. It's about those qualities overflowing hmm. and affecting other people. The lesson even says that people will notice a change in us and they'll ask, what's different about you? That's a powerful image, right? It's like our lives become a living example of the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? It doesn't stop there. The lesson goes even further. Oh, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Well, remember, we talked about the Holy Spirit being our counselor, our advocate. The lesson also talks about how he gives us the power to share our faith, mm. to be bold witnesses for Christ. I love that because sometimes it can be scary to talk about your faith, especially in a world that doesn't always want to hear it. Absolutely. But the lesson points to Acts 1.8, which promises that we'll receive power to be witnesses. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, it's like he gives us the courage and the words to speak the truth with love and conviction. So it's not about forcing our beliefs on others. It's about sharing the hope and the joy mm -hmm. that we found in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Exactly. And this is where we really see how all these things we've been talking about yeah. are connected. It all comes back to the Holy Spirit and how he changes our lives. This has been so insightful. We've covered so much from understanding the Holy Spirit's role as our counselor to exploring the fruits of the Spirit and the power he gives us to witness. It's clear that the Holy Spirit is much more than just a concept. He's a living, active presence in the lives of believers, empowering us to live lives that are full and impactful. I couldn't agree more. And before we move on, I think it's important to remember that this experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit isn't just for a special few, it's for every believer. That's a great point. It's not about becoming some kind of spiritual elite. It's about being open yeah. and receptive to God's work in our lives. But if it's for everyone, why don't we all experience this fullness? That's the big question, isn't it? And I think this is where we need to shift from understanding to doing. Because it's one thing to know about the Holy Spirit. It's another thing to actually experience his yeah. fullness. Okay, I'm ready to get practical. What are some things we can actually do to grow this relationship with the Holy Spirit? and let him fill us to overflowing. Well, the lesson reminds us that it starts with humility and surrender. You know, we got to admit that we need God, that we can't do this on our own. Like saying, hey, my glass is empty. I need you to fill it up. Yeah. And that means dealing with those obstacles we talked about before, the unconfessed sin, the doubts, the areas where we're not completely following God's will. Like cleaning up the mess. Yeah. Making room for the Holy Spirit to work. Exactly. And that's where repentance comes in. Being honest with God about where we fall short. Asking for his forgiveness. And turning away from those things that are messing up our relationship with him. And it's not just a one-time thing, is it? It's a constant process. Absolutely. It's a daily thing. Recognizing that we need him and letting him cleanse our hearts. And then there's faith. We talked about how important that is for receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Right, we have to believe that God is willing and able to fill us with his spirit. We gotta trust his promises and come to him with open hands, ready to receive. It's like saying, God, I believe you can do this. I trust you to fill me with your spirit. And that kind of faith opens the door for the Holy Spirit to move. It's not about forcing some feeling or emotion, it's about simply believing and trusting God. So repentance and faith, those are the keys to unlocking the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But are there any practical things we can do to nurture this relationship, to stay connected to him? Definitely. One of the most important things is spending time in God's word. That's how the Holy Spirit talks to us, guides us, yeah. and shows us his truth. Like having a conversation with God, listening to his voice, 
and letting his words change our thinking and our actions. Exactly. And then there's prayer, just talking to God, sharing our hearts with him, inviting him into everything we do. Like opening up the lines of communication, letting the Holy Spirit flow freely between us and God. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be some big formal thing. You can just talk to God throughout the day, tell him what's going on, the good and the bad, ask for his help. And don't forget about fellowship, spending time with other believers, encouraging each other, and learning from each other. That's huge. Being in community helps us push each other to grow, keep each other accountable, and experience the Holy Spirit working through a group of people who are united in Christ. It's like having a spiritual support group, people who can pray for us, encourage us, and help us stay on the right path. And let's not forget about worship. When we really worship God, when we show him our love and adoration, it creates a space where the Holy Spirit can move powerfully. Like we're inviting him to take over, to fill us with his presence and change our hearts. And as we do these things, repent, yeah. believe, spend time in God's word, pray, connect with other believers, and worship will become more sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. Like tuning our hearts to his frequency, becoming more aware of him and his voice and as that happens, we'll start to see those fruits of the Spirit showing up in our lives. The love, the joy, the peace, mm -hmm. the patience, they'll just flow naturally. Not because we're trying hard, but because the Holy Spirit is working in us. And that's when we really start living that abundant life Jesus promised. It's not about having a perfect life. It's about having a life full of purpose, meaning, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Exactly. It's about letting God do his thing, letting him change us into the people he created us to be. This has been such an amazing deep dive. We've talked about so much from understanding who the Holy Spirit is to figuring out how to experience his fullness. It's been great exploring these truths with you as we wrap up. I keep thinking about that question we asked earlier. If the Holy Spirit is like overflowing water, what's stopping our glasses from being full and overflowing to others? That's a powerful question to think about, isn't it? What would it look like for us to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit, not just for ourselves, but in a way that really impacts the people around us. That's the challenge we're all called to, I think, to let the Holy Spirit fill us to overflowing so we can be channels of his grace, his love, and his power in a world that desperately needs it. What a beautiful thought to end on. Thanks for joining us on this incredible journey, exploring the Holy Spirit. I hope you're leaving feeling encouraged, inspired, and maybe even a little thirsty. For more of him, 